Hi, I'm Siobhan and welcome to Angelman Academy. We hope you enjoy this course. Please join our mailing list and stay tuned for the latest offerings to support individuals with Angelman Syndrome. Hi, my name is Kate Hearn for today's course on Augmentative and Alternative Communication, or AAC. Augmentative and Alternative Communication is communication that adds to or replaces any communication difficulties that an individual has. Um, Augmentative and Alternative Communication, or AAC, oftentimes works within a system of many different modes of communication, from gest gestures and facial expressions to spoken words to typing to symbol, picture symbol based um, means of communication. Today, we're going to try to give you some background into what AAC is, some of the belief systems um, and theories that are behind what people who practice augmentative and alternative communication are doing. This will give you the information and vocabulary to work with your team to set your child up to be successful with augmentative and alternative communication. We're going to start by talking about the underlying principles of augmentative and alternative communication. Um, the first underlying principle is that everybody communicates, even people who do not have speech. Um, and that means everybody, even the youngest infant communicates. Um, they communicate through crying, through looking, and eventually through reaching, through sounds and movement. Everybody communicates. So our job is to help teach individuals who don't communicate verbally to use a system of communication that helps them talk about their wants and needs and hopes and wishes and what they think about their world. There are many ways to communicate. Um, some of the ways that you see pictured here include um, using picture symbols to point to or communication book, texting or text-based communications, speech, communication devices, typing on various kinds of devices, pointing to symbols, or using speech output communication devices, or using sign language. All of these are ways that we all communicate in the world um, through these various methods. And some of us use some of these methods more than others. All of these means are valuable and they all need to be honored. So our goal as parents and teachers and therapists is to teach and support the most efficient and understandable method. And that can vary from situation to situation. The reason I point this out is many individuals are actually quite good at communicating things like wanting a drink by reaching for their cup or pointing to their cup or pointing to their mouth um, or wanting the TV turned on by handing you the remote control. Um, these are perfectly fine methods of augmented communication. We can pair them with something more formal like spoken language or pointing to picture symbols or spelling. But in the end, the goal is always to be efficient and understandable. Um, and that's our focus, to make sure that individuals with complex communication needs with Angelman syndrome are able to um, be understood efficiently um, in their world. So some of the ways that we look at multimodal communication, which is all the different um, methods that somebody might use to communicate, um, when one way is through facial expressions. Um, you know, a lot of kids with Angelman syndrome have very bright facial expressions, but they also know how to make that crying face that lets you know that they're unhappy. Um, they might do a startled face that lets you know that they're surprised. Um, vocalizations are very common in individuals with Angelman syndrome. Their body movements, oftentimes their hand movements or their rocking, communicates different information. Eye pointing, which is staring or looking at something that they're interested in or that they want. Um, lots of kids with Angelman syndrome have natural gestures. Um, so they may have something that's not quite sign language, but is a gesture that people who know them know what it means. Many have verbal approximation. So that's a sound, maybe mum or up or stop, um, but different sounds that we know mean certain things, but they aren't necessarily words. Um, and they may have verbal speech that is words. 
Some individuals think to means to do become proficient at sign language, and that's either formal sign language or um, more of what we call a pidgin sign language, which is um, the signs but using English grammar. Um, picture exchange communication, I'll talk more about later, but PEX is one way that we often start communication. Um, communication boards and books, so books with symbols and pictures. Um, there's a system of books called POD, Pragmatic Organization of Dynamic Display, that is often used. And then there's high tech or electronic communication systems, um, things like Toby Dynabox, um, PRC. Satilo and tablets like iPads with apps. I'm going to talk all about some of those options in a little while. So one of our biggest goals is making sure that we honor all methods of multimodal communication. That means that we really try to avoid saying things like say it again with your talker or tell me with your talker. Um, it's better to have them use a gesture so maybe they sign that they want to drink in some way and instead of saying tell me with your talker you use their talker and you say you're telling me you want a drink so that they compare those gestures with the pictures and the words coming from the talker um, of course if you actually don't understand them um, suggesting they use your talk their talker is a great idea um, we want to use multimodal communication ourselves so we want to use signs and gestures as well as words and facial expressions and any communication system in order to model to the individual who's learning to use AAC how it's done. Um, <clears throat> if you want to demonstrate how something could be done in another mode, you should go ahead and do that. So if you have a child who is using a maybe a sign approximation, so instead of saying more, they're saying more, or they're saying more. Um, instead of um, instead of sort of correcting them, you could say, oh, you're telling me more. It's like this with our fingertips together, more. To sort of support what they're doing while teaching them to go to the next step. So one of the things that a lot of research has been done about is why people communicate. Why do we speak? Why do we um, use words and language in the world? Um, and this research has been specifically done around individuals who have complex communication needs. Um, also, it does vary somewhat from the research done by um, people who are interested in the application of behavior analysis or ABA. They have a different understanding of why people communicate. But linguists and speech therapists who study those with communication needs have come um, up with these five well-researched um, reasons why we communicate. So the first reason that we might communicate is for wants and needs, and I'm showing this sign for wants there. Um, and at first, when children are young, that's a larger percentage of why they communicate, um, but that fades out. Um, we always communicate wants and needs throughout our lives, but the need for, for that changes over time when we start using um, other reasons for communicating um, beyond wants and needs pretty pretty quickly as we grow up. Um, the next reason is information transfer. So that's telling somebody something. So it might be saying, you know, I don't like olives, please don't put them on my salad. Or it might be saying, you know, oh, I saw him last week. I think he'll be here again today. Um, it might be saying your name. It might be telling your caregiver, you know, um, on rainy days I wear my raincoat, it's in the closet. Uh, so that's information transfer, sharing factual information. The next is social closeness. These are things we say to form relationships with others. So this might be a compliment. It might be um, making a joking comment. It might be having an inside joke between the two of you. Um, it might be talking about something that's of interest between two people, but there are things that we say for the purpose of creating social closeness with other people. Oftentimes, many individuals with Angelman syndrome excel at finding ways for social closeness. Unfortunately, sometimes what this looks like is a lot of headlocks and hair pulling as bids for social closeness. So one of the things we're going to want to do is to teach them to use augmentative and alternative communication 
to make bids for social closeness instead of using their bodies to pull our bodies to them. Um, the next reason we communicate is social etiquette. These are the things we say because it's polite. Um, not just please and thank you, but the expected things. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Um, when somebody's had a loss, saying I'm sorry for your loss. The etiquette sort of things that we all say. You're, you're served a meal at somebody's house and you say, thank you very much. This is delicious. Um, so those pieces of politeness and social etiquette. Um, the next thing that's added um, was added after the original research by um, Buchelman and Miranda, who are some of the big names in AAC, along with Janice Light, who did the original research, is this idea of internal dialogue. And that's the conversations that we use language for inside our own heads. Um, so that's when we get up in the morning and we think to ourselves, oh, wow, it's Monday. I don't want to be awake. Um, I'm going to hit snooze. And then saying, you know what, if I want coffee before I leave, I have to get up. Um, so that whole conversation we have with ourselves. And what we found is people who don't have access to language from an early age, um, access to language that they can use, don't necessarily have these internal dialogues. So they have to learn language so that they can learn to have conversations in their own head with themselves, to regulate themselves to keep themselves um, understanding what's happening around them. And this is a, a big piece of why we have language, is, is this internal dialogue. And it's important to think about how do we teach that to our individuals who have complex communication needs? How do we help them have that internal dialogue? So the goal is to be able to communicate for all five of the functions. So you can see the functions here. So we've got why do we communicate right in the middle. We have social etiquette, to express our needs and wants, uh, to create social closeness, to share information. But then we also have our um, internal dialogue, which I didn't include in this graphical image here. But so social etiquette, we have things like manners, greetings and taking leave, so hello and goodbye, um, expressing appreciation and gratitude for um we have asking questions, which can fall under many things. It can be wants and needs. It can be social etiquette. It can be social closeness. Um, we have expressing our wants and needs, which can be to indicate discomfort, to request an action, to request help, to request a person, an object, um, or a tangible item. It can be to protest or reject, which is just another form of requesting. I request you stop. I request you leave me alone. Um, and to express our thoughts and ideas and hopes. So larger wants, you know, someday I want to um, go on a vacation to Iceland and explore glaciers. So that is, is still a request, but it's a far off hopes and dreams sort of request. Um, and then you have your, your social closeness. So things like um, to converse, to um, sustain a conversation, to initiate a conversation, to end a conversation, and to do all those things appropriately, to tell stories, to, to tell jokes, to tell pretend stories, and then sharing information. So things like expressing our opinions, I think that's great, I think that's terrible, um, to expressing our emotions, that makes me feel really sad. Um, to express an idea, you know, I have an idea, let's go get sushi for dinner, um, to label things, um, you know, I see the window, I see a dog outside, uh, to give an answer to a question and to comment. And our goal is for our alternative and our augmented communication users to do all of these things. And oftentimes we get very hung up over here on wants and needs and requesting. And it's such a tiny, tiny piece of what communication is. It's also something that many of our kids can do using natural gestures and facial expressions and pointing. Um, and it isn't terribly problematic when they do that. However, when they make their social closeness bids and they're putting people in headlocks or giving kind of aggressive hugs, um, that is more problematic. So we do need to focus on these other areas of communication so that we can replace some of these more problematic ways of expressing things with language through AAC. 
So one of the things that we talk a lot about in the field of augmentative and alternative communication is the idea of presuming competence. Um, this has kind of morphed over the years because presuming competence, which is when you see somebody that um, you believe that they are capable of learning and capable of participating, even if, if you do not have other proof, you presume that they are competent. So this has become kind of a touchy thing out there in the world. Um, so now what I usually say is that we, we presume potential. We presume possibility. Um, we presume that every child and adult that we meet um, is capable of doing more than they're doing right now. Um, and this idea is, has come from the idea of what we call the least dangerous assumption, which is sort of the um, speech and language and special education version of first do no harm. The criterion holds that without conclusive data, educational decisions should be based on assumptions which, incorrect, if incorrect, will provide the least danger for independent functioning. So that means that we're gonna make choices based on what's best for the child, um, even, even though in the past, choices were always made based on the assumption that they couldn't learn or they didn't understand anything. And now what we do instead is we say, well, we don't have any good data on our, on our kids. Um, individuals with Angelman syndrome have something called apraxia, which is a motor planning problem where the message doesn't move from the brain to the body efficiently or sometimes at all. Um, it, affects, it affects all parts of the body, but especially speech. Um, and that means that they can't be counted on to say what they know. And that just because they can't say something or do something doesn't mean they don't know it. Um, and now that we understand more about apraxia and the way it interplays with anxiety, so when individuals with Angelman are anxious, which we see a lot of, um, we see them having a need for eye contact, a need for, for hugs and holding people, um, some refusal kind of behaviors, things like sitting on the floor. Um, we see those things happen when there's more anxiety. So between the anxiety and the apraxia, we really can't get good educational data on a lot of individuals with Angelman syndrome. Um, and because we can't get good data, we can't just assume they don't know. We have to assume that they do know and they are learning and we are the ones who need to figure out how to help them show us what they know. Um, even in people who have you know, typical cognitive development, we know that if you tell a teacher they have the gifted class, even when they don't, at the end of the year, those children will test as if they're gifted um, because the way that we perceive people changes the way we treat them. And when we treat them differently, we get different results. So the, what we often say in AAC, and this is from a woman named Carol Zankari, who is a, um, a brilliant speech and language pathologist out of Nova South um, Eastern University, um, is that perception drives expectation. So what we perceive of a child, whether we perceive that they're quote unquote very low in expression I hate, or we perceive that they have lots of potential to learn in alternative ways, whatever we perceive is gonna change what we expect, right? So if I expect this child has lots of potential to learn when we present, present things in different ways, then I will expect them to show me that. But if I perceive that they're not capable, I won't expect to see anything. That expectation drives opportunity. I'm gonna let that child try more if I expect things from them. And the opportunity drives achievement. You give somebody a chance and they try it and then they do it, they've achieved something. And that achievement then again will change our perception. And it all works together in this way. Perception drives expectation, expectation drives opportunity, Opportunity drives achievement, achievement drives perception, and it just goes around and around and around. And if we always perceive individuals with Angelman or any other disability as incapable or low functioning or um, not able to achieve, then we're just going to be stuck in a loop where the perception, low perception makes the low expectation and low opportunities and then low achievement. But if we change it up a little and we start to perceive them as capable and then we expect them to do more um, and then we start to give them opportunities for that and they achieve whole new worlds open.
So some of the things we need to do um, as parents, but also to help teens do and to help um, early interventionists and teachers and speech therapists and doctors do is to check our assumptions. I think a lots of times we think we know what Angelman is or what a specific disability is. And we forget that a lot of these things are just myths and assumptions. So here are a few assumptions we need to check. One is that a historical belief of severe dis disability, developmental disability, is not educational data. Just because everything you read online says severe cognitive impairment, that's not based on data. That's based on one guy originally said severe cognitive impairment, and then every other researcher went on ahead and added that to what they wrote um, and then quoted each other. But it's possible nobody ever had any data. Um, and lots of times um, this moves into the, to the next level of things, which is a lot of the research we do have um, has been based on underestimations. So, for example, many years ago, actually not that many years ago, individuals with significant disabilities were placed in institutions. Um, they were never given any education. They were never um, taught. They were never given any communication. Um, and then because they never learned, it was assumed that they couldn't learn. Um, so when the research into disabilities tells us that people with Angelman syndrome or people with any syndrome um, have low cognitive ability, we have to look at which individuals they looked at. Did, that, did they decide that based on individuals who had never been to school, who had been taught in a substantially separate classroom where all they did was the alphabet from, you know, grade K to 12, and they, they never did anything beyond colors and um, just sitting in the same room all day? So really checking on, you know, do we really know? And if we don't know, we need to assume that these individuals can do more. Um, we also need to understand that individuals with assumed moderate to severe disabilities are more likely to suffer from educational neglect. And that goes right back to our ideas of perception driving opportunity that if you have an IEP or an individual that says that they have moderate to severe cognitive disabilities, then they not, may not get the quality of education that they need. Um, and finally, the data from children who have not been taught to communicate only indicates a lack of teaching or appropriate intervention, not a lack of potential to communicate. I get so frustrated sometimes because a lot of the studies that are done look at how do we teach these kids how to request. But most of them have ways to make their requests and ask for what they need. Um, I would love to see some studies that look at, you know, here are children who are using augmented communication and doing well. How were they taught? What was successful? Why are these kids successful? And how can we extrapolate that to make sure that the next group of children are successful? Um, so checking our assumptions and making sure that, you know, we're not, assuming anything negative as we move into our journey of augmented communication. Another thing I want to mention is something called the Communication Bill of Rights. The Communication Bill of Rights, um, and this is the older version on the screen, was put together by the National um, Committee for the Communication Needs of People with Severe Disabilities, a group called TASH and ASHA, which is the American Speech and Hearing Association. Um, since then, the National Joint Committee has revised these, but they still have very similar ideas behind them. Um, I think that for parents to understand that ASHA, the group that governs speech and language therapists, speech and language pathologists, this is from them. I would ask, you know, your teams to include this or the full version of this or the, the newer version of this. Um, in your IEP, it should be something that everybody's thinking about every day. Some of the rights that individuals with complex communication needs have are the right to be given real choices, not, you know, choices that are age inappropriate. It's appropriate to ask a three-year-old do they want to wear their red sweater or their blue sweater on a walk. But um, if you're asking a 14-year-old that question, you need to be thinking about more appropriate choices about their life and what they want to be doing. Um, the right to say no and to refuse any choice. The right to ask for what I want. 
the right to share my feelings, the right to be heard and understood, even if the answer is no. So um, I have a student who used to use his speech device to ask to watch Wheel of Fortune very frequently um, in the classroom when I was a teacher. And you know, although watching Wheel of Fortune was not going to happen in my classroom, um, he had the right to ask for that. And we always heard him and responded, you know, nope, we're not going to watch Wheel of Fortune right now. I hear that you want Wheel of Fortune. We're not watching it right now. Um, they have the, the right to use their speech system all of the time. So this means it doesn't stay in the backpack. We don't take it away during messy things like painting or lunch. We find ways to make it work during those times. We don't take it away if they're being too noisy or delete buttons if they're saying them over and over again. They have the right to their system all the time. And they have the right to be taught how to use, the, how to use their communication system. All too often, we hand a communication system to a child, and if they don't magically know how to use it within a week, we take it away and say they couldn't do it. Um, and that's not how language works, and that's not how any of us um, learn. We all need to be taught new things and to be supported while we experience new things. The right to be communicated with in a safe and appropriate and sensitive manner. Um, and that goes anywhere from not being talked down to, to not being talked about in front of you, um, to not having, you know, somebody carry your diaper in front of everybody where people can see it, or to talk about your medical conditions in front of other people, basic dignity and respect. Um, the right to be spoken with and not about, and that's huge. Um, a lot of times uh, individuals will have some behaviors, and when I go and observe to try to figure out what's going on, it, it turns out people were talking about the individual in front of them, and once they stop, the behaviors decrease. Um, the right to be spoken to with dignity and respect, the right to be a full and equal member of the community, whatever that community is, the right to have their communication system in working order, and the right to ask and know about their schedule and their world, and the right to um, have any information they need about what's going on in their environment. If we start to think about some of the things we term as negative behaviors or problematic behaviors, um, and start to think of them as places where the Communication Bill of Rights wasn't being enacted, I think we would find that we make more progress in communication and um, have less negative behaviors happening. Um, here's the newer adapted version of the Communication Bill of Rights. Um, both of these we'll put into the file section for this course, so you'll be able to download them. Um, and if you Google it, you'll find it online as well. So we're going to talk a little bit about AAC options. And I am um, going to talk a little bit about choosing AAC, and then I'm going to go over to another slideshow and um, just go through what some of the systems are. So when you're about to choose an AAC system, it's, it's kind of these days popular to just um, buy whatever your friend has or go get an iPad and put an app on it. But there are some things we need to be thinking about first. And hopefully you have a good speech therapist and special ed teacher and OT and PT who can work with you to figure this out. But an A to AC evaluation would look at the vision of the child. What size symbols do they need? Do they need higher contrast? Um, are they overlooking at things that have read? So maybe we avoid symbols with too much red. Um, we look at their hearing. Um, we look at the behavior as it relates to communication. You don't want the $15,000 de you know, delicate device for a child who might throw things. We look at motor skills, um, their fine motor skills and their ability to touch a button, their gross motor skills and ability to hold the device. We look at positioning and mobility. You know, will the child be walking around? Do they need to carry it? Where are the places they sit? Will they be using it lying in bed? Um, we look at how the child will select the buttons or what we call the access method. Um, and usually for an arrangement syndrome, that's touch, but not always. It can be a mouse, it can be a joystick. It can be something called switches. It can be an eye gaze system, which is um, cameras that track eye movement to. Um, allow the child to use eye movement to pick what they're saying. We think about sensory issues and sensitivities. Um, if there are certain sounds that upset a child, we won't, don't want them on their, their system, obviously. We think of any other features the child might need. Um, 
and we really try hard to think about an AAC plan for today and tomorrow. So we want a system that will work today and tomorrow. We don't want to keep changing systems every time new skills are learned. So I'm going to um, switch slideshows over and talk to you a little bit about the different choices that are out there um, and then come back over to this slideshow. So let's talk a little bit about the different AAC systems and symbols and some of the things you're going to need to know about AAC as you enter this world with your child who is Angelman syndrome or complex communication needs. Okay, so the first thing we want to know is there's all different kinds of AAC systems. Um, we're going to start by talking about AAC systems that don't use technology. So there are some object-based communication systems. These are often used with people who are deaf and blind or who have severe to profound cognitive impairments. Um, these are when we use real objects to represent people, places, and things. So um, handing somebody a hat means we're going outside. Jingling keys means we're going for a ride. Um, an alcohol light might mean we're going to the doctors. So remote control means we're going to watch TV. For the most part, individuals with Angelman syndrome, they've got this down. They know this. Um, I'm sure many of you have noticed if you pick up your bag or your purse or your keys, your child will wave goodbye. Um, they understand the association between objects and what happens in the world. So oftentimes we, we don't need to have a system on this level because we're, we're past this. Um, and then there are tangible symbol Um tangible symbol systems. Um, they are used for the more abstract things like um, yes and no. It's, it's hard to have objects to represent these things. Um, again, unless your child with Angelman syndrome has significant visual um, problems and visual difficulties, they're probably not going to be needing to use tangible symbol systems. Um, they're probably going to do just fine with, with pictures or for things that are um, don't involve that much touch. Um, there can also be 3D symbols. You can make them um, on a 3D printer. This is sort of a very exciting thing right now that's happening as people are, are making these 3D symbols. But um, when push comes to shove, I'm not so sure that it's uh, necessary for a lot of our individuals with Angelman syndrome. I think that a lot of them um, would do just fine if you moved right away to picture symbols um, and didn't spend any time doing these um, 3D symbols. Um, but of course, every child is different and for a child with um, really severe vision problems, this might be necessary. Now I wanna talk a little bit about PECs. I'm sure you've all um, heard about PECs. And I like this, um, this meme based on The Princess Bride where Indigo Montoya keep, says, uh, you keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. Um, and the thing about PEX is many people think PEX is what we call a picture symbol. That any picture symbol printed out on a card and laminated is called a PEX. And that is not true at all in any way. Um, PEX is the system of exchanging symbols. So it stands for Picture Exchange Communication System. It's not the picture itself. Um, a system, the system starts with a two to one staff to client ratio and fo focus on teaching requests um, and interverbals using a strict application of, of behavior analysis methodology. Um, we don't call, we also don't call the notebook that the pictures are in PEX. Um, PEX is the actual physical exchange. If your child is doing PECs at school, you need to find out if they're really doing PECs or if they're just calling something PECs. Um, you know, find out if the clinicians working with your child are trained by pyramid consultants in PECs. Find out um, if they're using the actual protocol and stages of PECs with the right number of staffing. Um, and, you know, just be very careful if PECs is misused. You can end up with a system that is um, overly reliant on MANS, which is um, requesting. Um, it's what ABA calls requesting MANS. Um, and nouns, so you might end up with a book of like 500 food items, but no way to say I love you and no way to say like, 
run or jump or um, any of those kind of words. Um, and you may miss opportunities for social closeness and other functions of communication, which, as I talked about earlier, are kind of where the need is in Angelman syndrome. Um, and I'm not saying PEX is bad. I'm saying that PEX is a, is a very specific system that's done in a certain way. And if your child is, is doing PEX or if you're trying to decide on PEX, um, make sure the person you're talking to is, is qualified and trained. But also try to understand some of the drawbacks. Um, so it is uh, developed by um, two people named Frost and Bondi, and you can find lots of their videos online, and they're um, adamantly against some of the other systems I'm going to talk about later. Um, but try to remember their target population is autistic beginning communicators. So children with autism who really are just the stage of understanding that you go to a person to interact and get something. Um, it really focuses on communication intent. The idea that, that you have a need within you and you're going to ask another human being to help get that need met. Um, so it really focuses on initiating, requesting, and picture discrimination. If your child can do these things, if your child can, if, if your child knows to get your attention before they ask for something, if they can ask for something by pointing or grabbing or handing things to you, if they can tell the difference between two pictures, if you can put two different snack um, uh, pictures of snacks in front of them and they know which one is which, they probably don't need to be doing that. They're probably past it, um, this level of communication, and you can move on to other systems. Um, but PEX is really great if you have a child who doesn't do those things. They don't initiate communication. They're not asking for things. They're not able to, to differentiate between different choices um, when shown in a, a picture format. PEX is really fantastic for, for those kids. And then hopefully you're going to move on quickly to something with a lot more language. Um, I have seen individuals with Angelman syndrome get stuck on low levels of PEX for many, many years. And then when there's move to a robust communication system, so a system with all kinds of words, um, they do fantastic. And some of that is the apraxia and anxiety, right? So um, PEX is asking the child to, to take the picture of the thing they want, Velcro it down, and then hand the whole Velcro strip to a person. Those are very complex motor things. Um, so the motor planning from the brain to get that to happen is very difficult in Angelman syndrome. And beyond that, you have the issue of you're doing it on demand. Somebody's telling you you have to get the picture and put it in hand it, at least at first. And that sort of demand creates more anxiety, which creates more apraxia. So sometimes PEX is, is contraindicated in some of our individuals. And it's a good idea to move on if you're feeling like you're stuck in PEX. So picture communication books are organized around for vocabulary. Um, oftentimes, core vocabulary are the words that make up about 80% of what we say. The words like he and she and go and it and up and down and pull and put um, and like and don't and no um, and how and when. Um, so these kinds of communication books have that core vocabulary. And then they may have some category-based pages with food words or uh, recess words or that sorts of things. Then there's a system called POD. POD was created by Gail Porter. Um, it's pragmatically organized, so organized in the, in the way that is practical. Um, the partner, communication partner, that would be us. Um, we operate the book. We turn the pages. Um, it's dynamic in that if you touch a picture or point, indicate a picture or symbol, there'll often be a note that says turn to page 7 or turn to page 5. Um, so that makes it dynamic. And then there are many levels. So you can go from nine per page to 75 per page um, for the number of things in the page. So you can start with something simple and work your way up. Um, and the emphasis is really on what we call modeling. Modeling is when we talk to kids in the language system we want them to learn. Um, and that can also be called aided language stim stimulation or aided, aided language input or partner augmented input. Um, but in general, that's all, all modeling. So POD is a system that we have seen 
quite a bit of success with out in the angel main community. Um, maybe more so with the pod app and the pod books. Um, but we do see quite a bit of success. And then we might have some light tech devices. So there's single message devices. The most commonly call heard one is called the Big Mac. Um, it's when you press a button and you record a message and then the student hits the top or, or the large button um, and it plays it back. So there's, you know, a bunch of different ones of these out there. None of these is an AAC system. They are AAC tools. They are not an AAC system. For example, you might have one of these that says, I need my communication book. And the child presses the button to get their book. Um, you might record, you might have things like, um, hey, come over here um, on it so you can get a child who's on the playground can call other peers over. Um, you might use it to record the lines in a play um, if the child is doing some, a play and some inclusion. Um, so these are not a system. They're not a solution in any way. They're, they're some tools that we can use to have voice output for individuals who are unable to speak. And then there's also sequenced out voice output devices. So these are um, systems where you have the button and you record a message, but um, you record a series of messages and they're played back in order. Um, there's also one um, from a company called Adaptivation that plays them back out of order, which is kind of fun for things like bingo. Um, but these are great for telling jokes, for um, having certain very predictable conversations, um, for, you know, calling out the bingo things, for reading off the words to give others a spelling test. Um, so lots of great roles for these, but remember, again, they're part of a system. These aren't a robust communication system. Next, we have these overlay-based devices. So these are devices where you use a, a sheet of paper or laminated paper with symbols printed on them, and you slide them in, and you record each square or each button to have a different message. Um, these are being seen less and less now that iPads are on the scene, um, but a lot of schools probably have them sitting down. They are a great way to put in some core language and, uh, and really start to, to use this core language um, while you've got a child who's learning those skills. Um, you can get anything from four to 20 or 30 buttons on these. Um, they're inexpensive. Um, if you mean, you know, $300 to $400 is inexpensive. Um, but they are, they are great options for at first as you're sort of getting started. Um, then you have some eye gaze um, choices. So these are choices where a child doesn't touch a button or activate a button, but they look at the choices. So there are a few different eye gaze based systems. There's with pictures, there's systems where you um, find your letter and then find your letter again to do spelling systems. So these can make um, great opportunities for learning how to uh, play with letters a little bit as you start to learn to read and write. Um, for kids who can't use their hands or, or need to use their eyes for communication. Then we have our dedicated um, high-tech devices. When we say dedicated, that's an insurance term. So dedicated means that the device will only do communication. It will not go online and let you play games. It, it won't work um, to, to do anything except communicate. Um, and the reason it's like that is the American insurance system requires that those other features be turned off. They don't want the taxpayers paying for people to have an email system, which I think is ridiculous, but that's beside the point. Um, so there are, all, there are a few different companies. The, the biggest ones right now um, in the U.S. are Toby Dynabox and Frankie Pren Romich, Romich, which uh, PRC is what everybody calls it. Um, and there are some other smaller ones, Forbes, Talks to Me Technology, um, a few others out there that aren't um, as large or well-known. In my state, um, you can only get funding from insurance for Toby Dynabox and PRC um, because of the vendors. Um, but in other states, Forbes and Talk to Me Technology and some of the other smaller companies um, can be purchased through insurance, so they might be an option. So all of these have touch screens. The newer versions in the past, you know, since the iPad was invented, have electroconductive um, touchscreen, so it's based on your skin touching the 
screen, not on pressing down hard or using your fingernail. Um, they all have systems where if you touch a picture, it um, may move to another picture, so that dynamic display part. They can be picture or text-based. They have tons of customization options from recording things to putting in videos, just lots and lots of stuff. Um, most have uh, pre-made vocabulary systems. So um, on the PRC devices, you can get Unity or you can get, um, which is their language system, or you can get uh, another system called Word Power. Um, on the Toby Dynabox systems, they're, and their company is a little bit in flux right now, but they have something called Core, um, Core First. They are just added something called the Grid, which they took over from another company. So I think we'll be seeing vocabulary options emerge there. Um, you can also have um, Pod on a Toby Dynabox device if you are using Pod. And then you have your um, some of the differences between them. So the language systems is a difference. Um, language systems are, can be set up in different ways, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, and you'll want to think about that when choosing a system. They may have different picture symbols. So um, on the PRC devices, you're going to have MinSpeak or Pixel symbols. Um, and on your Toby Dynabox or other devices, you might have PCS or picture communication symbols. Those are sometimes called board maker symbols because they were originally in um, the board maker books and software systems. Or symbol sticks, which is just another company that makes picture symbols. They all have pre made vocabulary sets and, and how you programming may be different. Um, none of these are terribly um, powerful computers. So that's important to know if you think you're going to do gaming or something on, on your device. You're probably not going to be able to do that. They're not that powerful. Um, after that, you have keyboard-based systems. So these are systems for people who spell. There are lots of options out there. Definitely be an ultimate goal for an individual with Angelin syndrome would be to be get the literacy skills they need to be able to use a system like that. Um, there's some options for people who are deafblind if you, your child has both vision and hearing impairment. And then there's um, what we're calling mass market devices. So that's iPad and Android devices. Um, so that's the iPad, the iPad mini, um, the iPad, the iPhone plus in the larger size, um, different Android devices. There are tons and tons of apps out there. Um, you know, of course, the, the price is lower. You've got about three, four, five hundred dollars for the iPad, depending on the amount of memory, and then most apps are, are three to four hundred dollars. Um, the good ones, anyway, for communication. Um, so that is the way a lot of people go with their devices, and there are many, many choices. Um, so there are some good reasons to decide on a dedicated device um, because you can get key guards more easily. That's um, plastic grids that make it easier to press the buttons. You can get them mounted more easily. Um, sometimes the touch screens are a little more powerful. The sound, they all have built-in speakers and the sound is better on the dedicated devices. Um, there are fewer distractions and you get access to tech support and repair. Um, I do want to make a note that I've covered these things. I also want to make a note that there are other reasons to choose uh, tablet-based devices too, obviously easier to replace. Um, you're in charge of it and not some company. You don't have to go through insurance. Um, you can use guided access to, which is a, a feature of an iPad that locks you into one app to make it less distracting. Um, so there, there are pros and cons to both dedicated devices and iPad or tablet-based devices. Finally, I want to mention that um, I presented these things in a certain order from um, what seems more simple or concrete like a real object to what is more complex like spelling. Um, but the truth is we don't really have any research that says that you have to start with concrete. Um, there, there's no good reason to, to start there. We also don't have any research that says you have to start with two and go to four and six buttons before you can go to a lot more. Um, do, you know, so 
we always doubt on the side of more language. Start with higher levels of abstraction with more buttons and then move down if that seems problematic. Um, you're, that is presuming competence and presuming potential a lot more than starting with a few things and moving up. Um, so don't um, let any anybody who sort of was trained in the past and, and hasn't been keeping up with how AAC is changing, don't let them convince you that you have to start with real objects or photographs um, before you can try something that is picture symbols or words. And don't let anybody convince you that you have to start with two or four or eight buttons before you can have more buttons. Um, those, those are just some myths that we're having a hard time um, getting rid of in the field. But there, there's no reason why we have to allow them to keep going. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about vocabulary arrangements. I'm just going to switch over my slideshows, and um, we'll continue for about another 10 minutes. Okay, so I talked a little bit about the different um, ways of arranging vocabulary um, that exist on the different devices or apps. Um, but I want to get into that a little bit more with you right now. Um, so what you may see out there is people who get um, very tied into the system that they like. Oftentimes, that they're tied into the system they tried first. Um, and they don't really uh, understand that there are different kinds of systems and that the best system is the system that's going to work for you. So let me talk a little bit about how buttons might be arranged in various systems, um, because understanding that can help you decide what's going to work for you and your child. So one way of arranging vocabulary that's very common is it's the categorical arrangement of words in a system. So the words are arranged by category and um, to some degree part of speech. So in a system like proloco to go which is there's a little screenshot of up here, you have, um, you have your people words here, so like I and you and your pronouns, it and that. And then you have a folder that goes to all people words. Um, and then you have your verbs here and you have a folder that goes to all actions. Um, and then you have over here a feelings folder and a folder that goes to feelings and a describing folder and a folder that goes to adjectives and adverbs. So it's arranged categorically. These systems are really good for someone who already understands language in their head so they understand language and how it works. So it makes sense for them to go to the action button to find a verb. Um, and then you have the semantic arrangement. So that's when words are configured with the same part of speech in the same location on every page. And the way you know what page a word is on is through word association to find the right page. So that's in LAMP, um, in something called Speak for Yourself, in Unity by PRC. Um, all of those work that way. So here's our, our main page. And right here we have an apple, right there, a red apple. If I were to click on that and then go to the spot on the page where the verb is, the verb would be eat. But if I were to click on that and go to the spot on the page where, the, um, where, where some of the adjectives were, you would have words like red. Um, so it's connected through this word association, but a verb is always in the verb spot and an adverb is always in the adverb spot and so on and so forth. Um, when you're learning this system, they have stories that teach you how to understand um, why something is where it is. Um, and it's all about motor planning. So the buttons stay very consistent and each word is only in one place. So in Proloco to Go, you have stop on the main page, but you're going to have stop on lots of other pages too. In something like LAMP or Unity, um, the word stop only exists in one place. Um, and that way you always know where it is. And your body learns the pattern to hit the button for stop without really thinking about it. Um, of all of these systems, the fastest users, the ones that you see speaking um, at like large conferences on augmented communication, they typically use a semantic arrangement of language. It, it is the fastest once you learn the motor plans. Um, and then there's a pragmatically arranged system like POD. Um, and in that kind of system, it's arranged in a purposeful way and in a practical way. So the child states their purpose, I have a question, 
um, before going to the question words. Or if they're telling you something, they say, I'm, I'm telling you something. And then they say, it already happened, which sets the grammar up for them so they don't have to think about their grammar. Um, so the most well-known pragmatic system is, of course, POD. And then there's alphabetical systems. And that's where if you are looking for a word that starts with A, you hit the letter A. Um, and truthfully, most systems are, are hybrid. So for loco to go is categorically arranged, but when you get to verbs, you then find that there are verbs arranged alphabetically. So if you can't find a more obscure verb, you would hit action words, um, actions A to Z, the letter L, and then whatever the find whatever verb but based on the first letter. Um, you also have might have an activity in page in here or the chat page in here that's arranged more pragmatically. Um, so lots, there's some hybridization going on between the two. Um, you will meet people who will insist that one of these is the best and the only one. And um, just take that with a grain of salt. So people get very tied to their favorite program and there are successful individuals with Angel in using all of these different kinds of programs. Let's talk a little bit about the research um, that is out there that we can use to break up some of the myths that are out there. So um, we have research that says multiple modes of communication, which we talked about at the very beginning, is one of the keys to successful communication. So we have, we have studies going back to 1985 that talk about that multi multimodal communication is extremely important. So if you are talking to someone who's insisting your child only use their talker, or only use sign language, um, you can let them know that this research has been done and it's well established. There's also a common myth out there that if you give a kid a device that then they won't um, learn to speak verbally. That is um, That research is actually really, really clear. AAC has no impact um, or sometimes increases verbal speech. Um, and that's 80% of the time that it might increase verbal speech. And again, this is really well done research that's very clear. Giving your kid a speech system is, is not going to stop them from talking. Um, another thing that we know is that uh, aided language stimulation, or what I called modeling earlier, is one of the most important ways that we teach language. You have to speak to your child in the language you expect them to learn. Um, I have the citation here for a meta-analysis on all of the studies that have been done on that, and it's very clear that modeling is a, a very key technique. Um, another thing that you sometimes um, have to argue about a little bit is the idea of starting big and having a larger number of buttons instead of a few large buttons. Um, so here's a study that um, clearly found that you want to start with more buttons and you can hide some of those buttons, make them not visible if you wish. But um, starting with a larger number of buttons leads to faster and more efficient communication than starting with a smaller number of buttons. Um, again, this is some older research, but the idea of a best system, um, the best system is the system that works. It's um, using um, a system that's research-based, and you're using nice evidence-based implementation like modeling. Um, and as long as you're using those things, the best system is the best system for your child. Um, we also see, um, and this goes back to what the previous slide, that a lot of young children do not have enough language on their communication system or even enough language to learn how to communicate. That's something we see in PECs a lot. Um, if you only have I want in, in five or six objects to choose from, then you don't have enough language to really learn language. Um, so the latest research tells us we have to give kids more words. You have to have words to prove you can use words. Um, there were some studies in the past that said that visual scenes can be helpful. Um, there are some things like um, snap scene that allow you to take a photograph and then um, draw an outline around certain spots and have those speak. Those are great for teaching language. They're not great for communication because, again, we get stuck with all those nouns. Um, but they're a fantastic tool for allowing kids to talk about photos of things in their world. 
Um, we also know that finding a symbol is easier than finding a page. Um, so we may have to give kids help to get to the right page of their book or device. Um, and that sometimes using a screenshot of a page is better for finding the correct page than a symbol of what that category would be, um, which is why some systems in the past have started automatically having screenshots be the button that um, shows you what's on the page you're going to. Um, so some things about supporting your new AAC user at home, you want to model, model, model. You want to ask open-ended questions of your child. Um, I'm sure we all develop the, uh, a need to ask yes-no questions, but it turns out that, um, of course, you, you don't need to say very much to answer a yes-no question. We want to be conspiratorial and not confrontational. We want to make it so we're in this language journey with them. It's not that we're challenging them and confronting them to get them to talk. Um, and we want to be a detective and not a, a director. So, um, and that's from a, a wonderful speech therapist named Caroline Musselwhite. Um, and she talks about you want to be a detective. You want to work with the child to figure out what they know, as opposed to bossing them around and telling them what to say. Um, another thing that you might want to think about doing is hanging up a poster at school and at home of your core language systems so that you can do more of this modeling at home. Um, and with that, I'm going to wrap up this intro to AAC. I hope it was helpful. Um, I'll have some uh, handouts, in particular the um, AAC Bill of Rights, um, in the section for um, handouts and files. And um, I wish you all the best of luck in your journeys um, towards becoming families that um, where the whole family uses augmentative and alternative communication. Thanks.